Well, good morning. Welcome to Spring Campus this morning. If you would stand with us and let's praise the Lord.
truth and justice shines like the sun and all is brilliant. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Especially great to see our first time visitors, both in person and online. My name is Pastor Gary, and it is a pleasure to have you here this morning. If you are new in the seat back in front of you, there's a welcome card. If you don't mind, if you could fill this out at the end of the service, you could drop it in the off receptacle. We'll be so that we can know a little bit more about you, reach out to you. If you have any questions, any prayer requests, if you're online and you're joining us for the first time, if you go to our website, bfchurch.com, you can click on the guest tab. Uh, fill out the short survey there, short, just a little bit of information. Again, we'll reach out to you. Also, if you have any prayer requests, this is also serves as a prayer request card. So on the back, if you have any on the comment section, you could fill out that prayer request. You could drop it in the off receptacle at the end of the church. It will be picked up. We'll put it on our prayer wall and know that our prayer warriors will be praying for you. Amen. It is an honor and a privilege to be standing with you in prayer. At this time, pre-COVID, this would be the time we would stand up, walk around, greet those that are new, and, and fellowship with those members or regular attenders. But unfortunately, we cannot do that. So if you would, look to your left, look to your right, look to your front, look to your back, and wave at those that are with you. Amen. And we are waving to you, also those of you joining us online. If you are online, be sure to comment. Let us know you are with joining us this morning. Today's word is out of John 1. One through five. So you will stand as we honor the Lord with the reading of his word. And this is God's word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do. We do thank you this morning, Father. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. And Father, we know that you are present, Father, because your word says we're two or more gathered in your name. You are here, Father. Father, we thank you for the message that we're going to receive, Father. Father, we pray, Father. Father, we we do not lose sight of who you are, Father. 
Father, we do not want to be a church of cowards, Father, where we do not share and, and, and uh, do not want to be the light in the world, Father. Father, give us conviction. Give us courage, Father, to share your word with the lost, Father, to be that light in the dark world, Father. Father, we thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please remain standing as we continue to worship. Because you were forsaken And I'm accepted You were condemned but I'm alive and well The Spirit lives within me Because you died and rose again
so kind to me. guys. I'll give another praise to the Lord. Good to see you this morning. You may be seated. Somebody say good morning. Good to see you here. I mean, we have just one simple ground rule. Don't be dead. <laughs> so, amen. The Bible says the dead praise not the Lord. So I'll let you figure that one out. Amen. Listen, uh, we're starting a new series called Jesus in Genesis, and I trust that you'll find it uh, as fascinating as I have, <laughs> because I have found it extremely fascinating as I've been getting to this word, been looking at this for a couple months in my own personal private study time, and really felt like I should just preach this, this stuff so good, amen? And so we're going to start with might be some interesting facts to, uh, as we get into this whole series. Mm, probably two-thirds of what I will do in this today's message is pretty much introduce, uh, giving you an idea of Scripture, the authority of Scriptures, and what the Bible has to say. 
uh, regarding uh, itself. Amen? So we'll look at that. Uh, one thing that's been interesting is to realize we talk about Jesus in Genesis. It's hard to call it portraits of Jesus, but because we see clear pictures. I've attempted and gotten really bad at it the last couple of months. I started about three months ago and put everything, all this equipment up, of taking and undertaking the task of uh, taking all those, for you that are younger, you'll get some explanation follows. VHS, <laughs> that's those old clanky tapes, you know, you used to put in the machine for recording. I had a VHS-C, which means it's a smaller one. And you have to put it in an adapter to play it in the big one. And I've been taking all those VHSC format videos from families and Christmases and vacations and just fun times with family and converting them into a digital format. So I've got this little machine that I purchased and you plug your VHS into it and then you plug a USB stick into the little device and you start the process. Well, uh, I've gotten about four done out of a stack like this. But I tell you one thing that's been exciting about it and really just fun is just going back and reliving so many things with family and friends. I don't know when the last time you took a family album out and just looked at it and re rehashed and remembered. All those things that are clearly seen. Uh, I was searching for a particular picture in a box of pictures that I have for someone who I, I mentioned this picture. I said, well, I've got a picture. I'll bring it to you. Well, I haven't found a picture yet, but I, went, I, I have the picture up here in my mind. I know what picture I'm looking for, all right? Because I have this mental picture. I know exactly who's in the picture, what the picture looks like, even what the people in the picture are wearing. And it's from 40 years ago. But that's still in my head. I know that picture's in that box because I saw it about five years ago in the box. So that's, there's, I don't know how many hundreds of pictures are in this. I've got like two big boxes like this of just pictures of family stuff. Polaroids, I know what those were, right? Uh, everything from Kodak to all the to film to everything you can imagine that's in there. So I went to look for the picture. I know it's in my mind. I can see it. Well, let me talk to you today about another picture because as we look at the Bible, there are pictures all throughout the Scripture that we should be looking for. And reality, as we discover uh, this today, I think you'll clearly understand what I'm talking about when I talk about pictures of Jesus and portraits of Jesus and photos of Jesus in the Old Testament and specifically within the book of Jesus because ultimately the Bible is a picture book. It's descriptive portraits. They're practically on every page. You can read them, and they come to life. Uh, I, I, this, it's not illustrated. Now, I know that some parents give their children illustrated Bibles with the stories of Jesus, and the, you have the characters or crayons and the Crayolas or all this stuff goes on. But I'm not talking about those kind of pictures. I'm talking about pictures that are, that are woven out and painted and brushed on the canvas of your mind that as you read the Scriptures, you see these pictures begin to develop, and they begin to become clear. One of the reasons I've always enjoyed going to Israel and have taken many groups to the Middle East is because I always try to tell people in preparation for it, if you've never been, what's going to happen to you once you go is that you're going to have clearer word pictures, these clear pictures in your mind of what the Bible is saying. Because we think in pictures. I mean, if I were to say to you, Pastor Gary, and we're off in a conversation somewhere, you'd have this mental picture that would pop up of Pastor Gary. We, we have a tendency to think in mental pictures. So in going to the, to the Middle East, you, these pictures get real clear focus. I mean, you're on the Sea of Galilee, and you've read about the Sea of Galilee, and you've read, read about Lake Gennesaret, and you've read about the Sea of Tiberias. It's amazing to find out they're all the same place, all right? But these pictures, they just come in clear. Those, those, those old cobblestone streets, when you go down to the city of Jerusalem, you see those. Boy, the pictures really come alive. Then you've had them in your mind. You've read the Bible, those, those pictures of the crucifixion. You've perhaps seen movies and all those things, but they're still within our hearts and minds. Well, the Bible is really good about drawing these pictures out. And the first, they're, they're not drawn by pen and pencil and brush like as an artist would take or even with photography or, or Polaroid, but they are visual when you begin to read them. There's, there are these mental pictures that are, that are images drawn out from the words of God and they're placed in your mind and you begin to build on those things of these mental pictures. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of how we, we, we go through the thought process anyway with a picture process. But the Bible's full of pictures. Again, not like a kid's Bible is illustrated, but written out in words and in accurate words and words that are uh, given to us by the Holy Spirit through the human authors that they're given to. And they develop in our mind as we begin to read about creation and we begin to read about the flood or we begin to read about some incident in, in the New Testament. We're seeing these kind of things in our, in our mind. They, they begin to develop. But one thing we discover, the longer you become, the longer you're walking with Christ, the longer after becoming Christian, the longer you serve the Lord, 
and you are diligent, at least have disciplines in your life to hear the Word and to read the Word and to listen to the Word of God, those pictures get a lot more in focus. They become sharper and they become more clear. But one thing you see and you discover, the longer that you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you soon begin to discover that there are pictures of Jesus all throughout the Bible. In the, in, from the beginning to the end. And I started about pictures of Jesus in the Bible, but said, well, we'd never finish that series for sure. Somebody had to pick that up, Gary would, because I'd be put in the ground and long before we even got deep into that series. But I am going to take some snapshots, basically, out of the book of Genesis in this series and find out as you search the scriptures, if you look long enough in scriptures, anywhere in the Bible, that there in that picture somewhere, you know, is Jesus. Not photobombing, all right, the, 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 the photograph, but there's a shadow, there's a hint, there's a picture. And the more that you know the Bible, boy, the more those shadows become vivid and they become reality and there, there's a, a clear indication of who the object of the passages really are all about anyway, who the focus of the whole Bible is really all about anyway, and Jesus Christ comes clearly into focus. The last book of the Bible is called Revelation. If you opened your Bible there, you don't have to, but you'll read right over where it says Revelation. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what it is, it's talking about that time when Jesus will be a, appear to all people, be revealed. But in, the truth of the matter is, you can write that title over every book of the Bible in reality. Because every book in the Bible is always pointing to our Redeemer. Always giving the story of redemption in one way or another, it's clear. Every incident recorded in the Scripture has a bearing directly or indirectly on the theme of revealing Jesus Christ. There was an old pastor who was telling his mentoring, a person he was mentoring there and leading and discipling, he said, you know, you've never found the true interpretation of any passage of Scriptures until you have found somewhere in that reference the Lord Jesus Christ. If you search long enough, you will find him standing there somewhere in the background. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's unmistakable, but faintly and dimly, but he's always there. In fact, if you look at the Bible and after you've been, had time to grow in Scripture, you begin to, Jesus is in all of the Bible. And he himself made that claim in John 5, 39. It says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these scriptures, so to say, it is these verses, it's this word that bear witness of me. So Jesus tells us that the scriptures are the witness of him. And again, in John chapter 5, verses 45 and 46, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe in me. For Moses wrote of me. Now that's a pretty profound statement because I'm going to go back. I don't know if where's, where's, where's uh, Moses, the book of Moses, five, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Where, where's the pictures of Jesus? But Jesus clearly states that Moses, in writing those five books of the Bible we call the Pentateuch, they are written there and there are pictures of Jesus throughout them. Jesus himself made the assertion about this fact that this revelation was of himself. And more than once, even after the resurrection, when he's talking to those guys on the road to Emmaus, what did he say to them? He said, I tell you, and he said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So what is he saying? We have this claim by the Lord Jesus Christ, even himself, that the scriptures speak of him. Human authors, anointed, inspired by the Holy Spirit, give us the New Testament. And many of them say the very same thing, that it's all about a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and making him clear and the story of redemption. You know, we live in a world that doesn't want to accept the Old Testament, much less the New Testament. We're living in a day of the skeptics, you know, and there's this continuing attack upon the Word of God that we have to deal with. But remember, I think Theodore Epp made this statement. He said, he's a great scholar from times gone by. He said, but if we but remember the Bible is the revelation, the unfailing of Jesus Christ, and the only pictures we have of him are the word pictures of the Bible, we can understand the reason for Satan's attack upon the Scriptures. He attacks the Scriptures because behind the attack upon the Scriptures is an attack upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Veiled as it is, but with critical examination of scriptures, you find Jesus, therefore the attack is really upon Jesus Christ. 
Now, it didn't begin, you know, in the wilderness experience in the book of Matthew when Jesus goes out for 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness. Satan attack, we know, begins in the Garden of Eden as he approaches Eve and he uses that line, kind of veiled as an inquisition, as a simple, innocent question. He says, yea, hath God said? Hath God said? Just what did, just what did God mean is what the question is. Well, what, did, what, what did God really say? And did he mean what he said? I mean, what did he say? You shall not eat of the fruit of the garden? Well, that's what the devil said, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said you should eat of all the trees of the garden, but this one tree. It kind of seems as he's approaching Eve, it seems like kind of an innocent inquiry for additional information. I think we should investigate this a little farther. Did God really mean this? Did God really say that? Poor unsuspecting Eve succumbs to this clever ruse of the enemy. In apparent good faith, not knowing the adversary's cunning schemes, she gave her own version of what God had said to her husband, Adam. After 5,000, 6,000 years as we've lived since that moment in the garden, Satan hadn't changed a thing. His strategy has not been altered. His, me his method and his motives have not been changed. I mean, it worked so perfectly the first time. Why should he change anything now? He's not a deviated from the original plan of deceit. He's still using the very same tactics, and he uses it under the guise of a search for knowledge. We need to know more. We need a better understanding. I mean, what did God really mean? I mean, the enemies of Jesus, the enemies of the Bible, the enemies of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ continue to repeat the same thing that the devil said. Oh, did God really mean? Did God really say? Did God really say? If you're going to be a student of the Word of God who learns anything from the Word of God, then you're going to have to embrace the fact of what I'm getting ready to present to you now. All right? Just how must we interpret the Word of God? I believe as Christians we must take the Word of God as a literal account, not as an allegory, all right? The books of Moses, especially the book of Genesis, they're the ones that seem to be under constant attack. You know, by the upper, the upper echelons of our learning establishments, they question the creation of man, the creation of the animals, the creation of the world, and set them all in the context of myths and fairy tales and fables. But once the question was once more half, God said, are we to take God's word literally or, as they suggest, do we just kind of spiritualize it, all right? Kind of accept it because it teaches a valuable lesson to us because we can have some kind of moral understanding. We can reject the historical accounts like the flood and creation and all that stuff, and, but we just take what we can get the good stuff out of the story. This is, you know, the Bible is not like, if you're familiar with Aesop's fables, Aesop's fables give a fairy tale story with a little moral lesson at the end. Well, that's not the Bible. The Bible is literally the Word of God, all right? And I think it's important you understand that because it's under the same little query that, the, that, the, that, that, that Satan uses in the garden that he continues to fool mankind today. I mean, everything seems to be that we do in science today is a quest for knowledge. We need more. We need to learn out who we are. We need to learn out where we came from. We are, so, we are so engrossed with our past, we forgot there's a future, all right, and that there's a present. We're going to send people into outer space. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to go to Mars. And the bottom line, besides the billions and billions of dollars, is we must learn who we really are. We must learn where we're really from. I can say, give me just a portion of that money. Hey, I'll do it for free. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created man. All right, there's the answer. And that God created man to have a relationship and to have a fellowship with him. And God has an eternal plan for all of our lives. But man sinned and fell and fell in the garden and rebelled against God and rebelled against what God had said and ruined the plan. But God had sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. You know, that's, that's the bottom line, hath God says. Do we, but do we accept it? I mean, are we just to take the word of God literally? Don't you think it'd be much more better if we just kind of spiritualize these things? I mean, because in the mind of the atheist, the agnostic, the intellectual who doesn't know Jesus Christ, because there are many intellectuals who do know Jesus Christ, but in the other minds, I mean, the story of creation is pretty much on the same level with the fable of Pandora's box and other pagan records of creation. And they're incorrect. The attack 
upon the, the veracity, upon the truth, upon the reality, and the historical account of creation in the book of Genesis, all right? It's kind of disguised as a sincere search for truth. It's really more of an attempt to discredit the written word of God. And every attempt to discredit the written word of God, underneath it, under, peel it back just a bit, you'll see is an undermining of the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's an attack upon Christ. If the record of the five books of Moses, as well as the rest of the scriptures, all right, is not fact, then Jesus Christ becomes either a deliberate imposter or an ignorant fool. I mean, if this is not true, if it's only true maybe in a portion, it's still the same, the same analysis that, hey, that Jesus was, was, was foolish. It's just ridiculous. But he wasn't foolish. He is the Lord of glory, and the word of God is true. Now, here's the shocker for some today, and you might use this in your apologetic reasoning with people who don't know the Word of God, who are not familiar with Christ and the truth of God's Word. You might even, say, when they start refuting Genesis and Exodus and these books of the Bible, you might let them know that, hey, do you know that Jesus believed the books of Moses? Jesus believed the five writings of those, those books. Did you know that he even quoted from in Scripture from the books of Moses? So not only did he quote it, he believed it, he taught it. Then he places his endorsement, which, by the way, is the highest endorsement you can get, upon the authority and upon the historicity of the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He believed in the historical account of creation. Why would he believe it? Well, on the side note, he was there. <laughs> so when the Pharisees came to Jesus, and remember they're always in a quest for knowledge, always trying to trip up Jesus, ultimately what the, what the goal is. They asked Jesus in Matthew 19, Hey, uh, Jesus, you know, uh, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? That's Matthew 19, 3. Look into Jesus' answer. He quotes from the second chapter of Genesis and said, And he answered them and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, by the way, the female, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, Jesus quoted that. It's in red letters. Well, you have red letter editions where all the sayings of Jesus are in red. But understand, that quote comes from a book of Moses, Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, verse 24, and it is word for word exactly what was written. So Jesus placed emphasis upon the story of the creation of man. Did he believe in the literal account of the first chapters of Genesis? You see, these supposed... Intelligentsia, the, the higher critics, the skeptics, the unbelievers, they're simply doing, uh, when they try to make us believe that the first few chapters of Genesis are mythology and fable, then they're basically, because Jesus endorses those things, basically trying to make a fool of Jesus. I mean, you're foolish if you believe those, and if Jesus believes this, well, then that makes him foolish, right? So you have to see with the bottom line, what the underlying thing is, this underhanded thing of, of denouncing the Lord Jesus Christ and how it works. But Jesus believed in the books of Moses. He believed in the book of Exodus. In fact, again, you know, he said in uncertain terms in, in Mark 12, when they came to him asking him about a woman who had been married seven times, whose husband would she be in the resurrection? Jesus quoted out of Mark, and he said, Listen, but regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? Basically, what's he doing? He's taking them back putting his stamp of approval on what the Bible had to say, the scriptures as they had it. Now, as I've gone through pictures and videotapes, you know, uh, uh, recordings that, that I have in my house, as well as the, the, the still pictures that are there and trying to convert them into digital pictures, you, you always want it to be sharp and to clean and to hope that, that it's out. I think that the, the more that we had the proper equipment, which is the Holy Spirit living in us, in our own hearts and lives, the more that we look at the Word of God and the more we're familiar with what the Bible is saying, then those things in the Old Testament where those pictures of Christ are, they become to get into clear and to a sharper image. It's called, if you study the Bible, it's called what is known as progressive revelation. Now, what I mean by that, the Bible is a progressive re re revelation of one central person, and it starts in the book of Genesis. One old preacher, I think it might have been Spurgeon, made this statement. It unfolds the drama of redemption beginning in the very opening verses of Genesis with the seed of woman crushing the head of the serpent and bursting into full glory in the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
In other words, there's this, there's this drama unfolding. There's this picture being clearly presented of redemption and of the Redeemer. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. When you first began to study the Bible and to read the Bible and look in the Scriptures, you first kind of see him in, 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 faintly, all right? He's kind of at a distance in the Bible in the, in the Old Testament. But as you study the Bible and as you grow in Christ, book upon book begins to very clearly give us a picture of him that is more detailed every time we open another book of the Bible. And they become like close-ups of this one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, given by sometimes as we have the uh, multiple authors of Scripture anointed and guided by the presence of the Holy Spirit, these multiple people are like spiritual photographers or spiritual artists as they lay out the story. Stop one stack upon another stack, and each time you understand a little bit more, then the picture becomes a little bit cleaner, a little bit sharper. It's not illustrated with pens and sketches like you might give your children an illustrated Bible with, with the pictures in it of Moses and Jesus and the disciples and, you know, all the different things. But it is illustrated in pen, and it is illustrated in word pictures, conveyed to our mind that begin to develop in our minds, our hearts and minds. When the gospel is shared, what happens in people's hearts and minds? They begin to get a clear picture of who they are, of who God is, what God's purpose is, what God's plans are, and what God has done about it. That's the beauty when the Bible says it's the preaching of the Word of God. That's God's ordained method, by the way, for revealing His Son in the Word. He says, I've chosen the foolishness of preaching. God uses preaching in this progressive picture that comes. In this ordained method where He says, I've chosen the foolishness of preaching. What happens when I preach or you share the gospel is those word images, those word pictures begin to develop in people's heart and mind. The Holy Spirit begins to take those things. He takes the literature that's giving the message. He speaks it through human voices. And it becomes unique because the Holy Spirit takes a word, which is not just a lesson in a history class. It's not just a lesson in geography, some, some subject in school. But it is the Word of God, which is a living Word, and the Holy Spirit takes that Word through the preaching of the Word of God and begins to build in your own heart and mind by convicting you and giving you a clear story of what God is really all about and who He really is and what His desired place is in your life. And it's this process of, of the Word being presented to you and the Holy Spirit bringing it to reality. The lights begin to come on. God begins to deal with you. And I, I remember struggling, you know, I... I I was under conviction. Have you ever been there? We said, what do you mean under conviction? Not by the state. <laughs> Not yet. But by the, by, by the, by the gospel message and by, by the Holy Spirit. You know, as, 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 as people would attempt to share the gospel with me or as a child hearing it from my mom, I, I didn't really want that message. I just wanted to do my own thing. I really wasn't interested in Jesus, you know. Really had no interest whatsoever at church, you know. It's the old, I had a drug problem as a kid. My mama drugged me to church, you know. That was me. You know, I could always, oh, I don't feel good today, mama. I'm sick. I, you know, I was one of those, you know. I just didn't, didn't really have an interest for it. But when God began to deal with me, and at the age of 21, man, I was under just that, that pressing and moving of God's presence in my life, training, seeking to bring me to a place of redemption, and I remember, you know, I'd been wrestling with it and people would witness to me and I'd push them away and didn't want to hear it. And, but I remember at one point just kind of getting this little moment of desperation. I said, I think I have a Bible around here somewhere. My mom would give me one when I left home at the ripe old age of 18. And so I dug around and I finally found this Bible my mom would give me. But I remember opening it up and I think I, I fell into that part of the scripture, you know, just kind of opened up something and point to it. it I, isn't that what I call the begats? You ever been to the begats? So-and-so begets so-and-so who begets so-and-so, and he begets so-and-so, and he begets. Yeah, I was, the begets made no sense to me. So I just kind of closed it in my frustration. But the Holy Spirit was still working in me it, and taking the Word of God and the message of God's grace and turning it and spinning it and working in my heart. I mean, the Bible is called the Word of God, right? And God's Word was working through spoken words and through lessons that had been taught. But catch this. The Bible as the Word is only really the source of information we have of Jesus, the living Word of God. It's just, it's just the, the starting point. There's, there's, there's something that becomes inseparable here. No one can understand the written Word of God, the Bible, without knowing the living incarnate Word of God, Jesus Christ. You see, this word, that's when the Bible talks about if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things passed. Part of the new creation is 
that you get now an ability to understand the Bible in a way you never had before. All right, you can read it historically. You can read it, you know, kind of fundamentally, traditionally, whatever way you want to approach it. But when Christ is received into your life by faith and what you've heard, the preaching of the Word, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the Bible. So we've heard the Bible. We've been under conviction, and God begins to deal with our hearts. And when we choose to say, okay, that's it, I'm surrendering to Christ and give my heart to Christ. You know, living this life the way I'm living, it ain't worth living. It ain't going nowhere. That's why I finally came to my life. I'm on a dead end road. And every time I think I find another road, it's a dead end. And by the mercy of God, God met me at each dead end. Thank God for that. But when Christ came into my heart, I could open the Bible now. And it, it, was a different, it was a different view. It was a different understanding. Because the Bible says when we come to Christ, we receive his Holy Spirit. And he's like the translator, all right? So let me repeat this. One cannot know the incarnate living word of God, Jesus Christ, apart from the written word, the Bible. That's the only source of information. But it's equally true that you cannot really know and understand the written word of God, the Bible, without knowing him who is the eternal living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't have one without the other to truly understand it. And one more word regarding the attacks upon the Bible. These vicious attempts of the enemy, ultimately, to destroy or to disprove the historicity and the authenticity of Scripture... Uh, is again an attempt on the life and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was on the earth, there was no New Testament. That came after the resurrection, all right, the establishment of the church. The scriptures, basically that the, that the Jews held, were 39 books of the Old Testament. And those were called, when Jesus said, search the scriptures, that's what he was talking about, those 39 books. The Old Testament witnesses repeatedly called are called into question by the so-called critics, all right? They're continually attacked by the skeptics, by unbelievers. We'll be soon in eight to ten weeks away. It's hard to believe it, but we'll be at Easter, first of April, a celebration of the resurrection. But you know as well as I do, as we get into those closing weeks of Easter, what happens? What happens? You turn on the History Channel. Y'all get the History Channel. You turn on the Smithsonian Channel. You turn on the Discovery Channel. You turn on whatever those are. They're all going to have some docudrama on the life of Jesus. And they're all going to end with questions and no answers. They're all going to give all these different theories, which are not Bible-based. They're going, well, was he a good man? Oh, maybe was he married? Did he have kids? <laughs> Did, did he rise from the dead? People don't rise from the dead. Y'all know that, right? All these things will be brought up in these docudramas, and, dramas, and they will, every one of them completely miss what the Bible has to say because they're not really interested in what the Bible has to say. They're interested in giving their spin, their concept, and their turn. And they basically will tell, oh, you know, the Bible's full of mistakes. It's full of errors. Yeah, I think the first one starts with Adam and Eve. <laughs> but they're not errors in itself. The first five books of the Bible are the ones that are constantly being attacked, especially. And that they should be accepted on one condition only, just that if you look close enough, there's some moral lesson that we can glean from it, but let's not take into historicity of it as facts. I had one learned theologian tell me. The Bible is inspired in spots. And you're inspired to spot the spots. Now, that sounds like really, not just genius, but it's ignorance, all right? All right? Because the Bible is inerrant. The Bible is the Word of God, and it is infallible. And if you, if you say, well, okay, well, well you, know, but, you know, there's got to be errors in it. I mean, there's, there's, there's got to be some errors in it. Well, where are they? Well, uh, the Holy Spirit will show you. Well, I think the Holy Spirit already showed me that the Word of God is infallible. It says of it itself that it's inspired of God. I mean, it's a very clear indication to what it is and what it says. And here's where it really gets down to. This is either the Bible, the Word of God, or it is not, all right? Because if you can point out anything in, of error in this record that we can't trust, and ultimately, how do you know you can trust the rest of it? If it's defiled, then it's defiled. It's the... Scripture says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. 
So this attack, again, is not just an attack upon the, 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 the written word of God. It is, in reality, a, an attack upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask a question. Can we accept the Bible, the written word of God, as historically correct and accurate and authentic and true to what it says? Well, I think that's a good person to ask, you know. I think we could ask Jesus. What did he think about it? What did Jesus think about the books of Moses? What did he think about Genesis? What did he think about this? Did he accept... Did Jesus accept what Moses had written as accurate and literal accounts of creation, the accurate and literal accounts of the beginning of the human race? And if you ask Jesus, is it accurate? Can it be trusted? The answer from the Lord is absolutely. Amen. It's a positive answer. Yes, you trust the Lord in the fallibility of scriptures. He accepted them. No matter what some pious new orthodoxy uh, insinuation might leave, Jesus leaves no doubt whatsoever when you study what he said about this estimate of the historic literal records of scripture and especially the book of jesus in fact there are very, two very clear endorsements there's others uh, by jesus of genesis one is the flood and the other is sodom and gomorrah that's just two there are others that we can point to but these are the two things the flood noah sodom and gomorrah lot's wife those are the things that just will not be accepted you know they're just it's a miraculous superstition you know it's 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 not to be accepted you have to discredit the story of the great flood you have to distort d d basically just do away with the whole idea about sodom and gomorrah well what was jesus estimate of all that in luke 17 jesus gives us in a clarity what he thinks about these he says it happened just as it happened in the days of Noah. So it shall also be in the days of the Son of Man. Eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. There's an endorsement by Jesus that what was written was actual, what was factual. Well, how about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt? Is that just mythological? Is that, that just something we kind of derive some kind of lesson for life out of? Jesus goes on the same passage. It was the same that happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Remember Lot's wife. Again, that's in red letters. <laughs> this is what Jesus said. Can't you see? that if we could prove the historical, literal record of the flood and of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife and just kind of make it merely folklore, that would certainly destroy all the faith we would have in the words of Jesus because Jesus endorsed those things. So again, the attack upon God's word and, and the literal record of these events destroys if it's accepted, it destroys our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say, put it this way. I think it's really all or nothing for Christians when it comes to the Bible. I mean, it's, it is all the infallible revelation of Jesus Christ. It is all the truth of God's word or just a worthless, silly piece of literature which we can kind of get some nice lessons from. I mean, that's, that's the only other option here. Or it is truly... The truth of God's word. In fact, it's interesting. As you study the word of God, and then you compare what the critics of the culture are saying. There are many critics of the Bible who make, with that, who make an assertion without any substantiating fact. Then even Father Abraham was not a historical figure. They will tell you that today. But once again, what did Jesus say about Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I was. So, the words of Jesus Christ. The word pictures of Jesus Christ. Let me get back to this. Are clearly... In scriptures, if we have the spiritual perception to look for them and to seek them out, we will find them. At first, they may seem vague. They may not be as definite as we like, kind of recognized as we read the rest of the scriptures. We begin to recognize them more clearly. I said this sermon series will be Jesus in Genesis. Well, here's the first picture of Jesus in Genesis that you see. And it starts with the very first book of the Bible, the very first verse in the Bible, which says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. Now, if that's all you read and read no further, you'd never see Jesus in that. If you had no understanding of the truth of God's word, if you never read the New Testament. But when you read scriptures and you open up the gospel of John and you read those first verses in the gospel of John, it tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. 
And the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, all of a sudden, clarity comes. The God of creation in Genesis 1, the same as the Word of God, Jesus Christ, in John chapter 1. The great creator, the, the Word of God, was Jesus Christ. It's established here in the Scriptures. Beyond any shadow of doubt now, because we have the fullness of Scriptures. In John 1, 14, it goes on to say this. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the Father, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of glory, grace and truth. So now we're seeing a picture of Jesus back in the very first verses of the Bible. We start getting a little glimpse of Christ. It becomes clear that it comes in. Jesus is the, is the Word of God. Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth. All that happened afterward was by him as the Word of God. In fact, no less than ten times in Scripture do we read this phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, it was by the word of God that everything was created. Paul puts it this way in the book of Colossians, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created, both the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he's before all things and in all things and in him all things are held together. Hebrews chapter 11. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, Jesus so that it was, what was seen was not made out of things which are visible. Psalms 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Since Jesus, the Christ, is the word of God, he is the word of creation. So we see in the very opening verses of the Bible, we're brought face to face, maybe not so clear at first, but the more you read, the more you understand, the more you compile, the picture comes into sharpness. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ in creation. The, Outline the faint image is, is it becomes clear, and there's no doubt to what is being meant when it says, In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's Jesus Christ in the beginning. So, as you look at this and as you look at Scripture, look for Jesus, look for Christ. I, I know that there's a, there are many opinions today concerning the Word of God, but there's no one decision that you as a Christian need to settle more quickly than any other is this, will you believe what is written? Is this the word of God? Jesus said the scriptures were the word of God. Jesus said they testified of him. Jesus said he believed even the first five books of Moses, which are always under assault. The very opening verses, we have the picture. The man of the book, the book for the man, the book of the man, the Lord Jesus Christ the God man. Now, I'll close it this way. You can read the Bible all day long, but if you don't know the author, you won't see him. It's so important that you accept the facts of Scripture if you're going to grow in Christ. Out of that will come discipline in your life. Out of that will come fruitfulness in your life. Out of that will come peace in your life. Out of that comes up. Listen, I can't tell you how much every day of our lives are truly dependent upon what God said. And when the devil asks, has God said, you should be prepared to say, here's what God said. Because that's exactly what Jesus did in his temptations. He said, and this is how much faith Jesus had in the written word of God. He's told the devil, it is written. It's written. Jesus believed the scriptures. <laughs> it's all about him anyway. Hallelujah. Man, what a mighty God we serve. What an amazing book we've been, we've been given. It is so important that you do not treat this book lightly, that you become a student of Scripture, that you're not satisfied to let somebody else do your Bible study or somebody else here just do the preaching, and you're not satisfied to even let somebody else speak the Word of God for you. We're all called to go to make disciples. And how do we go? With the Word of God, with the message of the gospel, with the message of God's mercy and grace. How important is it? Last year, we started the year out by going through, read the Bible through in one year, the chronological Bible. Many of you chose to embrace that. If you did not do that last year, I cannot encourage you enough to do it this year, to do it. But to stay true to reading scriptures regularly, feeding yourself the bread of heaven, feeding yourself the bread of life regularly, 
or you will starve to death and your spiritual person will become the weakest part of your whole life. And the old man will give rise in a resurrection in your life. The word of God is faithful. The word of God is true. Trust him. Trust it. Believe God. See what God does in your life this year specifically and especially. Hallelujah. Well, that's the beginning of the message we'll be sharing over the next few weeks. It'll be more specific. That's kind of like I say, the beginning of it, of an introduction. And we'll talk about Jesus and Genesis over the next weeks that we come into, as long as the Lord leads us and allows us to do that. We'll get enough to get you stirred up and interested to do it on your own. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand together. Do you know the word? Not just the written word. Do you know the living word? If you don't know the living word, why wait another day? Trust the Lord. Accept the Lord in your life. You know, at Believer's Fellowship, we give an opportunity for people to make a decision to know Christ. It starts right there at your seat. But I'd encourage you, there'll be myself and Pastor Girl being in the altar here this morning and at the front, if you'd like to, to make a decision to give your life to Christ. The Bible says we believe with our heart, but we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. There's a time of believing here privately, but of confessing publicly. And if you'd like to do that, say, listen, I'm, I'm ready to follow Christ as my Lord and Savior. Come share it with one of us. Make that, make that initial commitment to testify of God's mercy and grace in your life. The greatest thing I ever did in my life was ask Christ into my heart. Right after that, I think what nailed, nailed it supremely was me standing up and sharing with others, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. A confession of faith. Do that today. Maybe you know Christ and you know that maybe you've been immature in your approach to your spiritual walk in life. You haven't been disciplined in studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God. Why don't you make a fresh new commitment to the Lord to get back to the truth, get back in the Word of God. Make it the most valuable part of your day. Job said in the Old Testament, I have esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. Bible before breakfast. <laughs> That's something, amen. Trust the Lord. If you want someone to pray with you today, you just have a burden you're bearing, you want someone to pray with you, come. Pray with you, Gary Iyer. If you want to bring someone to the altar with you, come and pray. Or you just want to come to the altar by yourself and put something before the Lord. This is our time to do that. Don't, don't put it off. Let's, let's be obedient to Christ today. Come. Trust and believe and accept. Would you? As we worship the Lord. I've forgiven because you were forsaken. And I've accepted you were condemned. Spirit is with me because you died and rose again.
Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you, you are my King. Base of love, how can it be? your name and Lord we just stand in all Lord of your word and of your truth your power to change your power to save your power to heal your power to lift up and to restore Lord there are so many needs we have in our life but we acknowledge the fact that there's not one need that you cannot meet or that you're not using for your glory so guide our hearts and minds lead us into truth in Jesus name somebody say amen Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Again, thank you for being a part of our worship today. Those folks are on our online service. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to listen to what I shared Tuesday on our e-blast that I send out, video e-blast, I'd encourage you to go back to our Facebook, our YouTube channel, listen to that, especially folks online. I talked about having a re-entry plan. I know I'm not pushing, putting pressure on you. Uh, there are some folks who probably don't need to be out in public at this point in time with a contagious disease as contagious as it is. But there is going to be a point in time, I believe, when these things completely let up, and you need to have in your heart and mind your personal reentry plan. What is it going to be? Well, how is the Lord leading you? What's he saying to you when it's going to be your moment and your time to get back into the live worship services and live fellowship with other saints? There's got to be a time because, you know, the, the God makes it clear that he wants us in fellowship. I know we're all, well, I can do that by TV. About that much. <laughs> There's so much you cannot experience by not being here. It's just not going to happen. That's why the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. So uh, ask the Lord what it is. Ask him to give you a clear indication, give you a, and a peace that cannot be uh, uh, changed or upset, and he'll do that when it's time. I believe God's faithful. So I want you to know as your pastor, I'm concerned. I'm praying for you. I'm trusting God for you. I pray for you, and uh, I, I miss you when you're not here, and so does everybody else. So we love you. We're praying for protection, for faith, for courage, and uh, for each and everyone for good health. Amen. As, as your soul prospers. Praise the Lord. So we love you. But be praying about when that's going to be and what will be the sign. Is it a vaccination? Whatever that might be. That's between you and Jesus. You get it settled. I'll trust that you'll be faithful to hear from God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you came to church today? I hope you're as excited as I am about Jesus and Genesis. Amen. Because we're going to be looking at some more things next week. God bless you. Brother Gary has a few closing words. Amen. We'll have our evening activities tonight with Awanas, Lift, and our youth groups. Uh, Awanas and Lift, or Awanas and Youth start at 515. Our Lift group starts at 530. Don't forget our Wednesday Word. That's an online devotional that Pastor Tim and I alternate week to week, so be sure to look uh, for that. Now, if you aren't getting our uh, Tuesday update or our Wednesday word via email, uh, you can use that uh, welcome card, put your email address on there, drop it in the offering receptacle, and we'll add you to that list. Or you can just call the church and get added as well. Uh, we have a new date for our Journey 101. So our 101 is our introductory class, our me membership class. Uh, for Believer's Fellowship, that has been pushed to January 24th at 3 o'clock. So that'll be next Sunday at 3, 3 o'clock here at the church. Stay connected, of course, with our Facebook, YouTube, and BF Church. Now, who got the Wednesday word this past Wednesday? 
Raise your hand. It's a little different, right? When you clicked on the link and went straight to our website, uh, you know, just be praying for that. So something new, something that we're transitioning to. So be praying for that. That there's no glitches. I got some emails and texts that there were a couple of things, but we had is a working progress, a work in progress. And so, if you do see something, please be patient uh, as we are continuing to improve uh, what we send out as far as our uh, online devotionals and updates. Um, if you're a guest of ours, either in person or online, again, we have our welcome card. Please be sure to drop that off in the off receptacle. And finally, don't forget your tithes and offering. Three ways to give online, in person, or drop it off Sunday, uh, Monday through Thursday. If you go online, you can go to our website, bfchurch.com, bfchurch.com. Click on the Give tab. It'll take you to PayPal where you can give as well. Or you can always drop your offering in the off receptacle. Amen? Amen. With that being said, you are dismissed.